capable of, by itself, uh, completely changing geoeconomics, geopolitics, and uh, solving climate energy. Well, this picture shows Rossi with his um, device, which he calls the Energy Catalyzer, or ECAT for short. Um, he says what's happening is there's a nuclear reaction involving nickel and hydrogen. And since nuclear reactions uh, produce so much more energy than ordinary chemical reactions, this means you can get a vast amount of energy with very little um, consumption of fuel. Furthermore, you won't get any greenhouse gases produced. What is the evidence that a nuclear process is involved? Well, uh, there's some suggestion that copper is produced and uh, that it's nickel has been transmuted into copper, um, but clear evidence is in the regard to the amount of energy it produces. So there's maximum amount of energy you can produce in a chemical reaction. So if the device is producing vastly more energy than that, then it must be something else going on, either a nuclear reaction or some unknown process. It's been investigated a number of times. People have uh, come, teams have come in to investigate it. For example, in February this year, a test was carried out that ran for 18 hours. The amount of heat produced during that time was measured at 270 kilowatt hours. And that is the amount of energy you would get from 25 kilograms of petrol. And since the size of the reaction chamber is only 50 millimetres, this rather rules out the idea of energy being generated by any conventional source. It would appear to be very good evidence. Uh, if anyone's interested in the details of this, there's a Wikipedia re article on the Rossi reactor. There's also the Low Energy Nuclear Reactions website. However, there are some problems with the idea that it is a nuclear reaction. Because first of all, the conventional theory says that you need extremely high temperatures to get the reaction to go at a measurable rate. So people are sceptical on those grounds. On the other hand, there may be something wrong with theory. Because here we've got something happening in a solid. It's not um, in a gas with um, sort of isolated protons coming around. It's in a solid, so it may be that many protons can cooperate somehow and intensify the effect. So I think that's um, not such strong grounds for rejecting it. Uh, another piece of, um, another argument people have against this is to say that not many gamma rays are produced, an extremely small amount of gamma rays, and these um, fusion processes normally generate gamma rays. But then again we've got a very different kind of situation to what happens in thermonuclear processes, and you can see what might happen in this slide. We've got two, uh, right in two different situations, one is a rock <coughs> uh, just falling in air, falls of a crash on some surface. The other situation is where it's falling through water. Now, when it's falling through water, the energy is just gradually getting transferred to water. I mean, there isn't a big crash. So, I mean, that's just an example of why, uh, of an explanation of why you mightn't get gamma rays. There's really very little in the way of theory. Um, actually, lots of attempts have been made to explain it, but there isn't enough evidence to show which is right. So, uh, rather in the air, but it's, um, I think it's not impossible that um, an explanation will be found. How is the amount of heat measured? Well, this is really just school physics. Um, you're putting uh, cold water in and you're getting hotter water or steam coming out. And if you know how much water is going through, you know how much heat is produced, and that's um, all there is to it, really. Also, it's quite a bit of a big difference in temperature. Um, I've, uh, in, in some experiments, there's a five degree temperature rise. In other investigations, the water actually boiled. So you can't say that there are errors in measuring the temperature which are responsible for it. Why does energy need to be fed into the reactor to keep it going? Can't the energy it generates be fed back into the reactor so it can keep going with no extra energy input? According to Rossi, you can do that. He says it can be run in a mode where you aren't feeding energy in, but it's then difficult to stabilise it. So a practical application is you, you want to reactor which can easily be stabilised and so uh, the devices you're building have 
energy um, being fed in, and you control it simply by altering how much current's being fed into the device. You say you know greenhouse gases have evolved, but what about radioactivity? Well, Rossi says there are no radioactive residues. It's not like ordinary reactors where you have radioactive residues which go on emitting radiation and heat as well for a very long time. And also he says, should there be something like, uh, say, an earthquake and so on, then hydrogen would escape and the reaction would stop. So he claims at any rate that it's all very safe. Is it possible that Rossi is just fooling people? He's made it seem as if the reactor is heating up water, when he just is trying to persuade people to invest in it, or to buy it, when it actually doesn't really work. Uh, most people think that this is all a, a scam, uh, but it, it's not that plausible idea because he, ha he allows people to investigate it and they can decide what to measure, how to measure it. And they can also look inside and peer inside. The only thing they can't look at is the reactor vessel which contains um, his secret catalyst. Um, but you don't, it doesn't matter if you can't look into that because uh, so what you're trying to do is to um, see whether it could produce um, this vast amount of heat that's been measured and no matter what the process is, no matter what ordinary process is, it is, you can't produce more than a certain amount of energy in that amount of volume. So it doesn't really matter what you can't look inside. The reason he doesn't want to look, people to look inside is that they might discover how he does it. And he obviously, uh, since it's a commercial enterprise, doesn't want other people to be able to make it. Um, and uh, so that he would lose his, uh, what he gets back by selling the devices. Can't he protect the invention by patenting the ideas? Well, trouble is patenting is a rather tricky process if you want really to protect you. He has got some patents, but it's not fully protected as yet. If this is as important as you believe it is, how is it we haven't heard about it? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, one wonders about this. Um, why isn't uh, nature, say, uh, writing this up? I mean, it's the, the details are available, and nature doesn't seem to be interested. However, if you were in Sweden, um, you would know about it because there's a Swedish technology journal called Ni Technik. Someone there called Mats Lewin has been following it. Somebody told him about it, and he at any rate was interested, and he's been following it. In fact, he was responsible for some of the setups, and so uh, he's written a great number of articles over that time. But it's funny that people aren't interested, but it has its historical precedence. Um, one thing which is pretty similar was when the Wright brothers, um, they got their first flying machine, and people had seen it, and you would have thought this would be a tremendous interest, but very little was published. Um, the um, publisher of a local journal said when he was asked about it, they said, well, quite frankly, we didn't believe it. And then there's a, um, a typical example of scepticism was um, a newspaper which said the rights have flown or they have not flown. They possess a machine or they do not possess a machine. They're, in fact, either flyers or liars. It's difficult to fly. It's easy to say we have flown. So that really shows how um, a sceptical mind at work dismissing something in that way. So in the case of Rossi Reactor, people are just saying, well, it's easy to overlook something, but um, the question is what has been overlooked? It's such a simple measurement that it's not really clear what could have been overlooked. But of course, part of the problem is the history of cold fusion. Uh, Pons and Fleischmann brought out their original spectacular claims in a press conference they rather pushed into. And um, there's a lot of scepticism and they were attacked. Um, there's a problem of uh, actually uh, people tried to reproduce the experiment but they, uh, they didn't really, <clears throat> they thought it was a very easy experiment. You just had an electric current um, and lo and behold the reaction would go but it wasn't actually that simple. So the result was a lot of people uh, failed to get anything to happen and they denounced Barnes and Fleischmann said this is all incompetence and somehow their voice was heard more loudly than the other people who were successful. Um, the sceptics got in first. And so the scepticism bandwagon role 
And somebody invented the phrase fiasco of the century to describe it and you know, become the well-established fact that um, cold fusion was a delusion. So uh, Rossi had to fight against that general viewpoint. But he's really not so bothered about what the scientists think. In fact, he, he wasn't that keen on having scientists investigate. His original plan had been simply to make a big reactor um, producing so much power that people couldn't, um, uh, couldn't say it, nothing's happening. So that's how it went. Is the reactor claim really so unbelievable? Uh, well, it looks unbelievable at first sight, but always in physics there are things you haven't thought about. And I think the thing here, um, one of the possibilities, is that you're getting energy concentrated into a point, as I said before. Uh, a very familiar example of concentrating energy into a point is just hammering a nail. The energy you, you have wouldn't be able to get you into wood or whatever, but because it all gets concentrated into a point, that forces its way in. And so something like this may be happening. You may be pushing the hydrogen into the nickel and there's some obstruction or bottleneck and the um, uh, a lot of energy is produced in that point. That's uh, just one possibility. Another thing which is really quite similar, which people haven't uh, thought of in this context, but someone called Seth Putterman, um, he and his colleagues got a device to work which actually produced nuclear reactions in a tabletop experiment. And the way he did this was um, something called a pyroelectricity. Pyro um, you heat up a substance and an ele electric field is produced. And that electric field he focused onto a point and so there was, a, there was a very strong electric field at that point and that, um, he had his uh, crystal in deuterium gas and that ionized the deuterium and that uh, imparted, the electric fields imparted so much energy to it that there were nuclear reactions and neutrons were produced. So I mean it shouldn't be thought of as so impossible and um, well Fleischmann's original idea was uh, let's try um, having a material where hydrogen can um, be pushed in with high density, let's push in that hydrogen with an electric current, and let's see if anything happens, and lo and behold it did happen. And so it's been a gradual development, but Rossi's advance would appear to be to, to discover some a secret catalyst which makes the reaction go much faster, and make it a practical source of energy. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, as I see it, there are two different worlds. There's the world of the academic, and the uh, world of a practical person. The academic is mired in theory and um, wanting absolute proof and says this is nonsense, at least that's a general view. Meanwhile, Rossi is going ahead in the practical sphere where um, he's building these reactors and uh, people will, one hopes, see that they're producing um, lots of energy. His first reactor is due to be produced in October. And he, as a buyer for it. Um, people by the way don't have to pay until it's until they're convinced it's not that it is working, which is not what fraudsters do. So I think gradually it will take off. The unfortunate thing is there's been a delay. Uh, there will be a delay in it getting going just because the journals, the media who follow the scientists, um, refusing to publish anything. That delay will have consequences. So it really does matter from that point of view that Scientists and the media are looking away.